Okay, Bergson and the Holographic Theory of Mind, ongoing series, part 43, which is only about 40 more than I intended to do. So this will be on morphic resonance and Bergson, or more specifically, Rupert Sheldrake's concept of mor morphic resonance. And that'll take us to, again, a bit to spiders, but more precisely to human memory. And we'll be looking at Rupert's description of the what I call 100-year storage search failure. That is the attempt to find engrams or traces of memory experiences in the brain, which takes us to Lashley again for a bit. Rupert's notion of resonance across time, how it relates to Bergson's, and Rupert's test, an interesting test, which involves cross-generational memory, that is memories, learning being carried across individuals to other individuals in the same species. An interesting test. We'll be extending Rupert a, a bit via Bergson and Gibson in the tuning of the retrieval of experience. And we'll be adding in a tiny look at Whitehead since uh, Rupert brings him up. So let's begin resonating, so to speak, to Rupert. Rupert Sheldrake is known for his theory of morphic resonance. I mentioned this in the memory of spiders in number 26, for it is specifically assigned a role in a profound problem. How do spiders have a memory of how to build webs from generation to generation? Or birds, complex migration paths from say Minnesota to Mexico. For assigning this very complex knowledge to DNA, just the DNA molecules, a very massive stretch. Now, Rupert also applied this concept of morphic, morphic resonance to human memory and science set free. How simply we as humans retrieve a past experience. This fits very much within Bergson and Gibson. And I was told by a reviewer in, uh, for an article I'm uh, publishing that uh, Sheldrake is a Bergsonian, uh, which caused me to look into this a bit more, but I see he isn't really all that much of a Bergsonian resonates to him, but he isn't quite really as we'll see. And we can take this a bit further than uh, Rupert can. In number 26, looking at spider webs, scale to human size, we saw the extremely complex skill, problem after problem being solved by the spider, all context dependent where that web was going. Near one mile of web, web rope, when looked at in human terms, 1,500 connections at least, all sorts of solutions. For example, a web across that set of context, or a different type of web, or there's a web with a, off a tree branch, or another situation, or yet another situation. Context dependent, all built appropriately. The spider we saw could not be treated as an automaton or as a robo-arachnid driven by genetically programmed fixed neural circuitry. The complex sequence of motor forces driving his legs that varies totally by context cannot be treated as an associated chain of reflexes, which would make it easy to store as a program in DNA. Well, not that easy, actually. The spider seems to be using an ideal architecture, an ideal web creatively adopted to the conditions. Yet all this is supposedly encoded in DNA and with no explanation of how. It's a faith. DNA is loaded, not only with the responsibility for storing how to make webs, how to hunt flies, how to roll them up in your mesh, where to put webs, how to make love, etc., etc., etc. But its most important responsibility, the development of form. Again, a vast fluid structure, trillions of whirling atoms, electrons, all constrained to a frog, to the form of a frog. How is this done? The question, how does DNA actually direct form across the vast fluid structure of behaviors 
web building, migration, sys capture if you're an amoeba. For these are behaviors that could go all over the place, but they're constrained nicely to building webs, to migrating on a certain path, or the vast fluid structure behavior of form across all the trillions of atoms and electrons for cells, for frogs, for eyes, for spiders. The problem is the same. This is why we saw Carl Gunther argue that DNA serves as an index, a form of an in index, a retrieval key to fields that build and maintain the organism. The building of a heart, an eye, a cell, a kidney, all are behavior patterns carried out over space and time, like the building of a web or migrating to Mexico or again as an amoeba oozing over a cyst, without conscious decisions. For Gunther, these fields, memory patterns indexed by DNA to build and maintain eyes for frogs, for spiders, for crabs, or hearts, lungs, kidneys, also exist in the 4D field. In his terms, he saw this as the block time of relativity. Now, I've rejected this notion of block time. You go to my 8A and 8B on relativity, pretty long discussion. We need to go to Bergson on this, but we'll come back to this. We can view this indexing as a form of resonance. A particular DNA is resonant to a pattern in the field. This is where Sheldrake comes in. He has been arguing that fields control form, thus morphic fields, morphic related to form or form fields, and thus morphic resonance. His marshalling of the evidence supporting this with respect to form, very extensive. Now we're fo focusing on his discussion of human memory and his application of morphic resonance to this subject. Rufi begins by starting the standard or stating the standard conception. To quote, most people take it for granted that memories must somehow be stored in the brain as material traces. In ancient Greece, these traces were usually compared to impressions in wax. Now they are thought of by analogy with memory storage systems in computers. Although the metaphors change, the trace theory is taken for granted by most scientists and almost everyone else. He notes that, to quote, attempts to locate memory traces have been unsuccessful despite more than a century of research, costing many billions of dollars. Materialists, or physicalists, he says, have no other storage option. It's got to be in the brain. But he notes, more recent philosophers like Henry Bergson, Alfred North Whitehead, Bertrand Russell, and Ludwig Wittgenstein saw memories as direct connections across time, not material structures and brains. We'll visit this later, this view of Bergson, his view of Bergson versus Whitehead. His own view, memories depend on morphic resonance. All individuals are influenced by morphic resonance from their past. Morphic resonance depends on similarity, it's going to be key, since organisms are more similar to themselves in the past than to other members of their species. Self-resonance is highly specific. So organisms are more similar to themselves. So spiders are obviously quite similar to spiders in terms of their biological structure, their structures for action, their action systems, their brains, etc. So they're going to be able to send a quite unique resonance pattern, shall we say, through that 4D field, as opposed to amoebas, as opposed to humans, as opposed to chipmunks, etc. Then he says, individual memory and collective memory, so collective memory being the collective memory of spiders and how to build webs, individual memory, how we remember our own past experience, our canoe trips, our basketball games, 
They both depend on morphic resonance. They differ from each other in degree, not in kind. Rupert then starts his critique of the history of trace theory. So this is another take and an interesting one on what we saw in number 26. So firstly, we'll say there's a structural problem. Memories persist for decades, yet the nervous system is dynamic, continually changing down to the molecular level and beyond. The turnover of all is in a matter of days or weeks. Quoting Francis Quick, Crick, our double helix discoverer, how is memory stored so that its trace is relatively immune to molecular turnover? But no mechanism has ever been discovered, including Crick's complex method replacing molecules one at a time. So, the search failure. Pavlov, in 1890, conditioned dogs, as everyone knows, hear a bell, your dog hears bell, that means being fed. Eventually, when he hears the bell, the dog starts to salivate. Pavlov, to him, this was termed the conditioned reflex. To many scientists, this was termed reflex arcs, like connecting wires in a telephone exchange. But Pavlos was reluctant to say this. He had discovered that the conditioning could survive massive surgical damage to the brain. Yes, shades of Lashley. Lashley suspected the whole reflex arc thing. For rats, he trained them to respond in specific ways to a light. Nearly all of their motor, motor cortex was then cut out. They, they, but still they could perform as well as those not operated on. Monkeys trained to open boxes with latches. Then there was an operation. Nearly all the motor, motor cortex was again tossed. After two to, three, two to three months, they could move around again. And they opened the boxes promptly, no hesitation. So much for the motor cortex, right about there, with the X's, X out. Now for the associative areas of the cortex, where the arrows are. Deep incisions destroying cross connections, no problem. Cerebellum gone, totally, no problem. So lastly, suggestion, standing waves. To quote, the characteristics of the nervous network are such that when it is subject to any pattern of excitation, you may develop a pattern of activity reduplicated th through an entire functional area by spread of excitations, such as the surface of a liquid develops an interference pattern of spreading waves when it is disturbed at several points. I would note, but this is not much of a storage model, storage of experience. It, it might be patterns of excitation that one has or occur while stirring coffee. It, it does not account for the experience that is the external image, etc., of stirring coffee. But this led to Prebrum and his Lashley student and his holographic model of storage. Again, memory stored in a, in a distributed pattern analogous to the interference patterns of a hologram. Now for octopi, same phenomenon. A learning habit survives despite removal of various parts of the brain. Again, day old chicks. These were trained to avoid pecking colored lights. It made them sick. The finding was nerve cells in a region of the left forebrain underwent more, more rapid growth. Therefore, it looks like we found a place where the memory, the behavior, the learning is stored. It agreed with studies of young rats, kittens, and monkeys. But when this region was surgically removed a day later, chicks could still remember the, light, the colored light trick. Too bad. The region turns out to be not necessary for memory. Conclusion, some other storage system somewhere, which has been the standard mantra. More recent, mice learned to negotiate a maze. Actually, our activity in the medial temporal lobes, particularly the hippocampus, was observed. This was deemed to involve the long-term long potentiation or consolidation concept form protein synthesis in the nerve cells. But 
Once memories established, the hippocampus was destroyed on both sides and it was still a fail. The memories still existed. Conclusions, the memories move somehow, somewhere. I know we discussed the hippocampus problem in long-term potentiation a couple times. Back right there. At the, in number 36, experience story, also number 16, number 34. The wiring problem. The Connectome project, current project, aimed, is aimed at mapping the wiring of the brain, 100 billion neurons, each with 10,000 connections, lots of connections, 100 billion times 10,000. But there are huge differences in individual brains. The study on 15 neurons that control two small muscles of mouse ears discover there's no unique wiring diagram even for the same animal. Right versus left ear is different. Now John Lorber studied people with extreme hydrocephalus and found that they were extremely normal. He looked at 600. 60 had 95% of the cranial cavity filled with fluid. Some were seriously retarded, but some were normal. With IQs greater than 100, one had an IQ of 126 and had a math degree. Yet, he had a millimeter thick layer of cells. The rest fluid, virtually no brain. In fact, Lorber's article was entitled, Do We Really Need a Brain? So this is an interesting uh, phenomenon as well. It's at least some indication that uh, the shorthand I used to show the wave as all located in the brain, the reconstructive wave, is a little bit too uh, simplistic, that very likely the wave, the reconstructive wave, well, not very, very, not very likely, but almost certainly uh, covers the entire body. The, the whole brain body system is the reconstructive wave. Moths, caterpillars. Here is a study where caterpillars were trained to avoid the odor of ethyl acetate. Yet as moths, they still avoided it. Yet in metamorphosis, that nice process where the caterpillar goes from a, to a, a cocoon, transforms and becomes a moth, almost all the tissues are dissol dissolved and most of the nervous system. So how does that memory still make it to the, to the moth? subject of amnesia. Rupert knows this fundamental fact. After that conk in the head, the lost memories often return. He quotes Lashley again to quote, I believe that the evidence strongly favors the view that amnesia from brain injury rarely, if ever, is due to the destruction of specific memory traces. Rather, the amnesias represent a lower level of vigilance, a greater difficulty in activating the organized pattern of traces. Now, an interesting phenomenon, however, for events immediately preceding the blow may be lost permanently. For example, the motorist remembers approaching the crossroads of the eventual accident. Nothing more. Doesn't remember being hit, the car, car hitting him, uh, the events subsequently, or receiving electroconvulsive therapy. Same thing. You see the guy coming at you with the device, and uh, but then no memory of being touched or what happened. So no memory of what happened immediately before. So Rupert asks, is this the prevention of memory traces, that is neural traces, even being formed? Or is it the prevention of forming new morphic fields? That is, the event cannot be or was not related to events of the past. He notes aphasias, loss of words, language, ability of language, ability to draw, for example. This clearly is damaged to certain brain areas, specific brain areas that support this class of retrieval or skill. The immediately before that is immediately before a blow or a shock, that immediately before memory loss. What is happening here? 
I think this is a question. I know it's not covered, pretty sure, by Bergson and his long treatment of amnesia aphasias. A treatment, by the way, that Rupert just seems unaware of, because I don't see how he could not at least mention it otherwise, because this is what is this was a pioneering effort at the whole uh, concept of the trace problem, the failure of the of the, of the uh, storage uh, story. So he says to quote the failure to form a morphic field of the event, which we which we saw. Well, that's not exactly constant with Bergson's indivisible flow of time, because all is in the past. The the flow there toward the crossroads and beyond is still at least all part of the transforming holographic field, the time extension, the four-dimensional structure. However, an aspect of it, a few seconds before, a minute, a second before the crash, does not appear to be part of one's experience that's rememberable. I'm not quite sure how to assess that. It hasn't quite hit me as an, an interesting problem, but it is, because it's truly a problem with the relation of uh, in the role of uh, neural processing to memory to experience. One thing that struck me is that perception is always a memory. It's a specification of a past time extent of the transforming holographic field. So what if that specification can't even be made? That is, is the second before the car hits at 60 miles per hour not even processed, that is, the, that chunk of the event not even specified, and of course, a bit thereafter as well. Uh, simply nothing to remember. Uh, I'd note uh, this may also apply to uh, the dogmen, of which we apparently have a few in Wisconsin. One was seen uh, a couple of years ago, not far from, from my, my place, but uh, you always want a theory that's not species specific. Uh, there were famous experiments by Wilder Penfield, Tricker 1950, involving the electrical stimulation of the cortex. Stimulating the auditory or visual cortex, you got auditory or, or visual hallucinations, flowers, animals, familiar people, dreamlike memories, maybe mom baking cookies, or a conversation, though not necessarily actual historical. I remember reading one conversation that a uh, fellow described where it had nothing to do with anything in his uh, actual life. It's, it's almost as though sometimes say in meditation or falling asleep when here is a conversation that has no relation to your life whatsoever and yet you're hearing this conversation. So it seems to be again related to something that you're tuning into, resonating to somehow in that uh, field in which we live. Now I'd note, my own note here, again a blast from the past for my doctoral thesis when I was going through this in 1976, that Maul did studies where he showed that what is retrieved is context dependent. That is, the same cortical area could be stimulated, but if you proceed the stimulation with a conversation on war, you're going to get war-related memories or with a conversation on childhood, then you're going to stimulate childhood memories. So clearly there's no particular thing stored at that particular place. You're in, in fact, it's all implying that you're inducing a, uh, a form in the field, shall we say, an event, war, childhood, that's uh, causing a retrieval pattern, a resonant pattern. Now, Penfield initially assumed this meant the memories were stored in the stimulated tissue, and it's kind of always been taken this way uh, in uh, historical lore, but, but he changed his mind. He called this a mistake. The record is not in the cortex, said Penfield. Like Lashley and Prebrum, he gave up on localized memory traces and moved to the distributed over the brain view. Going back to Prebrum and this distributed throughout the brain concept, Rupert notes, but what if the holographic wave patterns are not stored in the brain at all? 
Prebum later came to this conclusion and thought of the brain as a waveform analyzer rather than as a storage system, comparing it to a radio receiver that picked up waveforms from the implicate order, rendering them explicit. A little article in 1979 from, in, a, in a publication called Zygon. Um, so we're, he's looking at the holographic field there, my symbol, but he's calling it a uh, waveform analyzer. The brain is a waveform analyzer. Uh, this, of course, came from Bohm's influence on Prebrum. But as I pointed out in number 17 and number 25, my, my difficulty with Bohm and Prebrum, well, why don't you go the whole way with the holographic analogy, holographic model? Why not say the brain is a reconstructive wave specific to or specifying the coffee cup, that is specifying a source within the holographic field now as an image of the field. And of course, they don't go that way because you have to have the whole concept of subject and object related in terms of time, not space, and uh, a quite different understanding of the problem. But I cover that in 17 and 25. So Bohm, for Rupert's, description of Bohm, the manifest world uses this explic explicate or unfolded order. So you have the explicit order emerging from the implicate or infolded or holographic order. So my, there's my picture there that you have the holographic field where things don't quite look like uh, they do to us now. Uh, the holographic field, the implicate order, and then you have the very explicit order, the unfolded coffee cup. The implicate order contains a kind of memory. What happens in one place is introjected into the implicate, which is potentially present everywhere. Thereafter, when the implicate order unfolds into the explicate, this memory affects what happens. This, says Rupert, is very similar to morphic resonance. Thus, each moment would contain, to quote, a projection of the reinjection of the previous moments which is a kind of memory. So that would result in a general replication of past forms. Now, this language, we'll have to come back to this, a projection of the reinjection of the previous moment. So he's quoting Bohm from another obscure source where he's describing what, what you're having as, as each successive moment comes that that previous moment's got to be re-injected into the, into the uh, current moment uh, over and over and over again. So I think Bergson has a better way of describing this, but we'll come back. So Rupert begins his examples with habituation, his examples of morphic resonance. So much for the trace theory history. Thought many things were brought out that were interesting. But now to morphic resonance, habituation. This little organism, this stentor resili, is a single cell little being. It's got rows of fine little beating hairs or cilia. If jolted, the stentor contracts into its tube. If nothing happens after about half a minute, it extends the tube again. If the same, same stimulus recurs, after a while, it doesn't bother to contract anymore. It knows about that stimulus. Now, how is this memory explained? For the stentor, has no synapses, etc. It's a single cell. He says morphic resonance is a straightforward explanation. The organism is in resonance with its own past patterns of activity. Again, like our two spiders that are resonant to it with, 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 because they're they have the same kind of structure. Again, in this case, we have the same little cell structure. When the stimulus is repeated, the organism res resonates with its previous pattern of response. Rupert hits the subject of recognition. The recognition is pretty much defined operationally nowadays in terms of the situation where we are shown A, then B, then X, then Y, then Z, etc. For example, well, we'll say little toy trucks, and later, we were shown X again and asked, 
how confident are you that you saw X? Is everything goes away and you're asked, how confident are you or that you saw the, the garbage truck? You give X a familiarity writing. You, you rate it from say one to five where five is very familiar. So this guy says four, pretty familiar. Now in recall, same thing, we're shown say the same set of uh, little trucks, maybe X, Y, Z. Later, you're simply asked, well, tell us everything you saw, name all the trucks. And you try to bring them all back. That's your mission should you choose to accept it. And recognition is generally considered easier than recall. Now, interesting, again, blast from the past. In uh, my doctoral thesis, I noticed that recognition experiments are an interesting source for the concept that everything is stored. For example, Roger Shepard, a well-known name in uh, psychological research, showed, six, so, so, showed subjects 600 pictures, picture after picture after picture being presented. Later, the sub subjects were presented a pair, say X and Y, where let's say X was one of the original pictures and Y was not. In other words, a garbage truck and an airplane. Uh, where the airplane was never seen. And the question was, which was seen? Well, subjects were correct 98% of the time in identifying which one was actually seen. This was later replicated by Standing et al. with 2,500 of these items, and the subjects were 90% correct. So again, this is an indication that, well, boy, this, this entire set of items, 2,500, appears to have been, quote, stored at least were resonant to them all. There's a resonance pattern available to all 2,500 items. Continuing with Ruger, recognition, like habituation, depends on morphic resonance with previous similar patterns of activity. So resonance with previous similar patterns of activity. The pattern of vibratory activity within your sensory organs when you see a person you know is similar to the pattern when you saw the same person before. The sensory stimuli are similar and have similar effects on the sense organs and nervous system. He says the greater the similarity, the stronger the resonance. Now, I'm not sure he's entirely aware of this, but what he's saying is he's assuming a felt resonance, a concrete feeling supporting underlying recognition, that is underlying conscious recognition of um, the truck or whatever. It's what would be termed an intrinsic intentionality. intentionality. That is, it is not the simple matching of two symbols as in AI. If X equals X prime, then a match, then issue a recognize statement. That is a purely symbolic operation, spatial, timeless, and had nothing to do with consciousness. So morphic resonance is taking us to the real conscious basis of recognition. Let's amplify Rupert's resonance with Burks and Gibson. That is, relate his recognition as a resonance to similar events and to this resonance as across time. The across time is heavily reliant on Bergson's temporal metaphysic. Just noted it here, we'll come back. Similarity, as Rupert noted, the greater the similarity, the stronger the resonance. In the Bergson-Gibson framework, this can be made more precise for what is similarity. We come back to the invariant structure of events. The coffee stir in the velocity flow fields, adiabatic ratios, inertial tensors, uh, carried over the haptic flow fields, acoustical invariance, texture gradients, ratios, and the capability of parametric variation of these structures. Again, the coffee stirring as an invariant structure is a parametrically variable structure. Coffee stirring with this invariance is defined by a set of parametric values, the normal circular amplitude value of the stirring, the resistance of the coffee medium, the value of the inertial tensor, the form of the radial velocity flow. Cake batter stirring is another set of values on these various parameter ranges, in this case, a much bigger amplitude of, of a circular motion or greater resistance. Cement stirring 
at another point on the range, far greater resistance, for example. But stirring in general involves a parameter range embracing all these invariants, or a set of dimensions of, of, of ranges. For example, up there we have coffee stirring as one spot on this continuum, cake batter stirring another, this, this continuum being the amplitude, the circular amplitude involved. One, could, one dimension could be resistance, etc. Stirring in general, again, covers this entire range. So recognition performance, as measured by familiarity values, again, an experimental subject has presented a bunch of items, again, say A, B, C, D, later presented C, you know, rate C in familiarity, how familiar is C, but now make A, B, C, D events rather than just static items. Okay, coffee stirring, pancake flipping, pouring a cup full of coffee, egg breaking. By manipulating the event parameters, for example, of the coffee stirring event, which we understand a little bit, the event will be increasingly less recognized or rated as increasingly less familiar as the test stimulus parameter values verge towards, say, soup stirring or cake batter stirring. You say, how familiar is that? Well, if that if re, if you were presented coffee stirring originally and represented something like um, soup stirring, you're not going to give it a high familiarity value. You might have been doing an initial test where you were, you were given you were you stirred various something like a coffee stirring. You're not going to have the same um, parameter values involving the, the uh, inertial tensors, the resistance, et cetera, at all in your, uh, in your uh, kinesthetic flow. Again, another example, take tree growth. There's a precise law defining tree growth. Okay, the, the, um, the number of branches, a function of the height, uh, and, the, and the diameter. So, uh, the height is a function of uh, or the, uh, the diamond is a function of the height as well. So you have this little invariant slot of de de defining tree growth. So, and in this case, if you if, if you pick an item, for example, that it's it's simply a, a special case of an event. It's a stage or a sample along a trajectory of growth. So you could again do your recognition test. It'd be termed a forced choice test. Like, like we saw with um, Shepard et al. or, or um, Standin et al. where they, did you see this or this? Okay, uh, likewise, you, you could simply rate this tree as familiar, one to five. What did you see? Is how, how familiar is that tree? And the rating will fall as the tree moves further away from the original, up the, the arrow up there, uh, the original tree, as, as a tree moves farther away in the growth direction, either direction, your familiarity rating's going to fall. So in other words, you'd have a graph, familiarity values are going to um, increase as a, as a function of increasing parametric fidelity to that original stimulus. We can do the same thing with the growth of the head, the facial profile. We've discussed this before, you take a cardioid, place it over the uh, uh, a grid, a matrix, okay, and, and then you can apply a strain transformation where you expand the grid in all directions, and that generates a, uh, a, a growing, as you, as you expand, you, you generate a set of facial profiles that grow along the age dimension. So you have a strain parameter, K, which you're now parameterizing. Again, just like the last slides, if you present, if you pick one, the item is a special case of an event, a sample along the tra trajectory of growth. Again, you could have a forced choice recognition test, or you could rate this profile as familiar, you know, one to five. And the rating will fall as the head moves further away from the original in either direction along the growth trajectory. I've, I gave several more of these examples in, in number four.
revisit, re, revisiting this in this context of Rupert and recognition. So for any model of memory, this is a requirement, as I noted before. Number four, a requirement based on the transformations and invariance allows defining events. Memory retrieval is based on dynamic events. And we noted connectionism cannot deal with this because connectionism is nothing but static relations as, as uh, these networks show. Here a spoon can can stir, but you know it, it can stir, it can scoop, it can cut, but this, that's a static set of relations. It has nothing to do with the, the dynamics of the event. Connectionist networks have nothing to do with these dynamics of that invariant structure listed there. So this is a requirement for any memory model. But this is a big hurdle to the current theoretical mind because what, what you're invoking here uh, is a global residence, Rupert's morphic residence, over the brain slash body. You're not retrieving static features of an event from cortical cells or from networks. You're not retrieving anything from the brain at all. You're simply resonating to a similar structure. Now in chapter four, Rupert describes the tradition of panpsychism. He then notes Bergson. Bergson took this tradition of thought to a new level, that is panpsychism, by emphasizing the importance of memory. All physical events contain a memory of the past, which is what enables them to endure. And going on, the unconscious matter of mechanistic physics was assumed by Bergson's contemporaries to persist unchanged until acted upon by external forces. Matter lived in an eternal instant and had no time within it. Hence, the little picture I always like to show of the blocks of space. That is, each cube here is the all of space at an infinitesimally short instant, the duration of a mathematical point, each having the duration of a mathematical point. Each of those blocks is the present, and each of those blocks is matter. Matter has the extent of the present, which is a mathematical point. So to go on, Bergson argued that mechanistic physics treated changes cinematographically, as if it were a series of static moments, as if there were a series of static moments. So literally like a, a projector, and a little more uh, faithfully here, you're projecting one block, space, then another, then another, never more than one block of space at a time, one present, and that being matter. This is literally the logic of the classic metaphysic. That is, there's never more than one block of space slash matter with a, a duration of, an, of a mathematical point. They just cannot stay consistently within this framework, as we'll see. But to go on, but for him, for Bergson, this kind of physics was an abstraction that left out the essential feature of living nature. To quote Bergson, duration is essentially a continu continuation of what no longer exists into what does exist. Duration therefore implies consciousness, and we therefore place consciousness at the heart of things for the very reason that we credit them with a time that endures. I note that Rupert is quoting Bergson here from Skirbina's recent work, Panpsychism in the West, not directly from Bergson, which is a difficulty with Rupert because I don't believe he's read Bergson. So this characterization of Bergson, memory is the retention of the past and the present, or all physical events contain a memory of the past. To simply go stay with this is an ineffective statement. It's just kind of weak. It's a kind of a weak philosophical statement. I hit this in a reviewer recently, counseling me on Bergson, actually sending me to, to Rupert. Um, he, to him, this is how you describe Bergson. And I disagree. The emphasis must be on the two different metaphysics, the classic and the temporal, and the fact that physics itself faces this fork in the road. I want to go through this again in another way to uh, show why it must be approached this way.
you have the two metaphysics, the classic metaphysic, simply an abstract space, a principle of infinite divisibility, an infinitely divisible continuum, like a 3D block or continuum of ultimately of mathematical points. In its treatment of motion, motion is a series of instants, each coordinate with a point on the continuum. That is, the motion traces a line of points. But this is an infinite regress. Be between each point, you have to re reintroduce the motion. So the rat moves along the continuum as, a as point after point after point, each point an instant. But to treat that motion as point after point, you have to reintroduce the motion between each point. And this is an infinite regress. Time becomes the, trans the transformation of the material field now becomes that series of, inst series of instantaneous blocks of space, each with, with a duration of a mathematical point, each block ultimately completely homogeneous with no qualities. On the other hand, the temporal metaphysic, motion is indivisible. There are no instants. Space is extensity. It is not a point continuum. Extensity like our lake there. Time, the transformation of the material field, is indivisible, non-differentiable is another way of putting it. And the whole is transforming, like Birkin said, like a kaleidoscope, kaleidoscope. And in this whole, in this global transformation, objects and motions, quote unquote objects and quote motions, are transferences of state in the global motion of the whole. Continuing the temporal metaphysic, thus there is real motion and real simultaneity in this global transformation of the whole, the whole field. Roses bloom, stars explode, trees grow. No aspects of these motions can be relativized. That is, you cannot say that a stationary observer with the rose is wrong, that aspects, all aspects of those motions are simultaneous, that in reality he's moving and the, uh, therefore things that he judges simultaneous are not. Sorry, but this, it's an organic motion within the whole that cannot be relativized. This is the core problem with special relativity, which in, in reality is only a logical refinement of the classic metaphysics. The stark contrast of the two metaphysics makes this clear. This is already a problem at the door of physics. In physics and psychology, it's now being rather clearly understood or clearly entwined. Quantum mechanics now has invoked consciousness as perhaps the problem at its uh, base. And time is now being seen as a critical subject in physics. And this too is clear. Language like this doesn't do much. A projection of the reinjection of the previous moments, or even Bergson's phrase, the retention of the past and the present, leaving it at that is not sufficient. One has to paint the Bergsonian differentiation of the two metaphysics. And at some point, physics and psychology have to move to a new fundamental metaphysic on space and time. So this classic metaphysic is the origin of the storage search failure. It lies at its origin. This discrete instant vision of time is the very reason for storage in the brain. Each present instant instantly moves into non-existence, into the past. And you have the equation matter equals the present equals the brain being matter and therefore the brain being matter being present must store the instant. That is, it must work furiously to store the present instant before it's lost into non-existence in the past. You can see the logical problem already. But this blind science to the continuity of flow required for invariance that are only defined over time, over continuous flow. Therefore, science is blinded to the necessity of some form of 4D storage in the brain, which could never be explicated or shown how it's done. You cannot store invariance over time in a series of states in a 3D brain. That is a series of storage areas in a 
3D brain. It's not going to work. The inherent illogic is so bad in this metaphysic that they simply cannot stay within it. Theorists routinely invoke the continuity of neural processes to explain the perception of time extended events, such as our coffee stirring up there. But the difficulty is there's never more than one instant. That is, when space two arrives, space one is gone and the brain with it. Then when space three arrives, space two is gone and the brain with it. So as there is never more than one instant, the brain's neural processes can have no continuity in the metaphysic. But nevertheless, they invoke it because they don't want to admit the implications for the very reason of the metaphysic, which is the very reason they're storing or trying to extort experience in the brain in the first place so it doesn't go away. So after all this, does Bergson's metaphysic help explicate, make clearer what Rupert's fields are, how they work? I hate to say this, but not really. It certainly supports it, as uh, Rupert realized. Does a mass of these very concrete experiences, very visual, very kinesthetic, involving forces, motor forces, etc., in the virtual, in the virtuality of the 4D field, all of the same pattern, all resonating together, become a field? Perhaps. Still, there is the problem of spider number one, discussed in number 26. How did the first spider know how to build a web? Where did the morphic field for web building come from? And also, how these fields act upon the brain or bring about action. It brings you right back to free will, voluntary action, dynamic schemes, these subjects discussed already in number nine and number 31, inherent in Bergson. So all of these are tough questions. So let's move on. It moves on from Bergson to what seems his favorite, Whitehead. Paragraphs devoted to each, Bergson one, Whitehead 10. Of course, Whitehead, Wittgenstein, Heidegger, these are considered the top three in the modern philosophical pantheon, way, way above Bergson by everyone's accounts. Of course, we looked in number 27 at Heidegger versus Bergson, and here Heidegger did not come off that well, especially when, this, when considering the hard problem. So I thought about discussing these passages on Whitehead here, but it would take us too much into the weeds relative to the subject. I think Rupert himself has not read Whitehead, nor for that matter Bergson. He knows that process in reality is notoriously difficult, which is everyone's statement. But here's just one statement I just have to note to quote, perhaps the most astonishing and original feature of Whitehead's theory was his new perspective on the relationship between mind and body as a relationship in time. The usual way of conceiving this relationship is spatial. Your mind is inside your body while the physical world is outside. And he goes on, by contrast for Whitehead, mind and matter are related as phases in a process. Time, not space, is the key to their relationship. Now we could go on for the comparison and relationship between Whitehead and Bergson on time could be interesting. But this astonishing and original feature, to quote unquote, is simply again a sad testimony to the burial, burial of Bergson. What happened to this? Questions of subject and object and the union and the distinction must be treated in terms of time, not space, from Matter and Memory, 1896. Whitehead acknowledges his debt to Bergson. It is unclear what the debt is to me. A scan of the Bergson references and uh, process and reality, mostly on intuition. I debated on looking at process and reality any deeper than uh, I have. Um, I don't think it would, it's gonna do much for us. So I'll think about it. There are a couple of red flags, I'm quite sure. Relativity, what well, it accepts both relativity and quantum mechanics. Though irreconcilable in his mind, each is valid in its sphere. This is his bifurcation of reality. 
But again, I would ask, which relativity? The logically consistent, the current interpretation, a logical mess, the curious variant, if it, if, if it can be called that, that is used for Maxwell. I've not read Whitehead on this, but I'm suspecting it's the current interpretation, the logical mess, which begs the question and the reading of duration and simultaneity by Bergson, who took the equations apart in detail and showed what the logically consistent version is. And once you understand the logically consistent version, the effort to relate it to quantum mechanics becomes irrelevant. You don't bother. There's no need. It's irrelevant. But it's probably worse. The fact of real motion, real simultaneity, the motions of objects being phases, transferences of state within a global motion, very likely very bad things for Whitehead's analysis. Secondly, psychology. There's no discussion of research in Whitehead. Yet for matter and memory, two of the four chapters were devoted to memory research findings, to amnesia, aphasia, the current understanding thereof and the implications thereof. As I noted recently, Bergson worried philosophers would be uninterested because after all, why would philosophers be bothered with memory research? Yet for Bergson, the entire effort of philosophy should be to tie philosophy to the fact, which means research. But Whitehead? Good question. And, and the difficulty is this is endemic. In my observation, we have physicists pouring into the problem of consciousness, neuroscientists, computer scientists all pouring in, yet considering the many dimensions of subjects that all relate, cognitive psychology, child cognitive development, memory research theory, language, all unnecessary to jump in and discuss the problem of consciousness. Did I mention perception theory? No. Just a complaint. A complaint. An observation. As I look at reviews on Whitehead, on processing reality, discussions, I see comments like, incredibly tough to read, notoriously new jargon, slow, difficult, convoluted, for all the fog of the book, it's great, or so-and-so. These same kinds of comments are made for Heidegger. Same things. Bergson wrote clearly, lucidly, with great use of metaphor. If difficult, it is because of the Zen wrenching of the mind needed, and the invention of holography would have helped, speaking of matter and memory. And I think matter and memory was the one that was the most difficult because the first chapter that could have used holography. I think I made it clear that he blew Heidegger away, that Heidegger failed to grasp Bergson on time, may have even concealed his debt to Bergson. It's just strange. These guys who wrote in so difficult a way are understood given top billing and Bergson deemed far beneath. So Rupert proposes a test, Rupert's test. He says if memories are stored in the brain, they should be confined to that brain. At death, the memory should be gone. If memory is a resonant phenomenon, a resonant phenomenon, where organisms specifically resonate with themselves in the past, collective memory and individual memory are the same phenomenon, differing only in degree. I saw this quote long before. So, in this case, then, we have the spider collectively sort of manifesting a collective memory of how to build webs due to the self-similarity of all spiders to one another, or some set of spiders with making certain kinds of webs. And a guy there remembering his uh, experiences canoeing upon observing a canoe. Again, some similarity, self-resonance, something like morphic resonance. So though all the modifications I would add, as we've seen on invariance laws, because that is what similarity is. This can be tested. In fact, he says it has been tested.
There was a long series of experiments, conducted first at Harvard, then at Edinburgh and Melbourne. At Harvard, rats learned to escape from a water maze. The more that learned it, the easier it became for the rest. So rats following the original rats learned easier than their predecessors. At Edinburgh and Melbourne, the Scottish and Australian rats took up where the Harvard's, Harvard rats left off. Their descendants learned even faster. Some got it right the very first time. At Melbourne, rats from untrained parents still showed the same effect. That is, this was not being passed through the genes. To quote, all similar rats learned, he's emphasizing that structural similarity of rats, learned quicker, just as morphic resonance would predict. This is a toughie for the concept of storage in the brain. Rupert notes the resonance, shall we say, of this with the Flynn effect, the increasing IQ scores with human generations. The question is why? Rupert would say it's morphic resonance. This dictum will likely hold for a while for orthodox science, though. If it can't be stored, it must be ignored. But the implications are wide. Being, our being, reflecting the constant influence of the past, or the injection of the past into the present, as Bohm put it, or the indivisible flow for Bergson. Rupert notes the relation to the Buddhist concept, also the Hindu concept of reincarnation, the effect of a past life or past lives upon the present, i.e. you're inordinately afraid of water because you've drowned in shipwrecks three times in past lives. But how all this actually works, how morphic fields work, what are morphic fields, and memory is so much more than just morphic resonance. That is, there's a whole problem of images, images and voluntary action in language comprehension and dynamic schemes, the transition from the virtual to the image, to the action, as we've discussed. Yes, it could go under the notion of morphic resonance, but we're breaking it down. Bergson provides you the metaphysic and the start in the discussions that we talked about on, on the right there and dynamic schemes on how things work. But it's a metaphysic in which a better physics might tackle all this. But the step needs physics. It needs neuroscience. But to go back, if it can't be stored, it must be ignored. Unfortunately, no experience can be stored. Where the problem begins, in the orthodox model, which is a perception, that is no model in reality. There's no solution to the problem of perception of the image of the coffee cup out there externally to us. A time extended dynamically transforming event that's perceived as stirring. Because experience is not solely within the brain, it cannot be stored there. That's where your model begins and where the problem begins then. Then ignorance of Gibson. The implications of invariance laws and invariance that can only be defined over time, over, over a continuous flow or transformation. In the classic metaphysic in which the stored search and standard perception theory, of which there isn't much, are based. The failure of the stored search, the search for the engram for traces is simply a symptom. Their theoretical ship has been torpedoed before it sailed. Sailors just don't know it yet. So next, we'll see. Until then, signing off.